11 years ago in this church, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Thank you. No, I mean, it was all glory to God. I mean, I was responding to what he was doing. But one of the things that happened, one of the clearest things that transitioned in my life at that moment was this. Before being a Christian, although I had a lot to enjoy in life, I wasn't like I was totally depressed and hated life. Underlying everything, there was uncertainty. Underlying all the sort of positive things that were happening in my life, at a baseline, there was so much uncertainty. And when I became a Christian, although all my problems didn't, didn't disappear, suddenly the greatest change was this. I went from a place of uncertainty about so much in life to a place of certainty. For example, what does God look like? Look at Jesus. He will perfectly tell you. What should I prioritize in my life? Look at Jesus. Look at the things he prioritized and do those. What happens when we die? Jesus talked to us an awful lot about that. The list goes on. This was the big transition that happened. I went from a place of uncertainty to a place of certainty. And God in his grace has given the world this book called the Bible, which is just bursting with amazing crystal clear truth about what God is like so we can be certain. Can I have a little woohoo or something? Thank you, very good. But, distorting already, but I don't know whether you're anything like me, but I found pretty quickly in my life that although God wants us as Christians to be so in a place of having certainty about so many things, every so often our wonderful, wonderful God leads us into a place where it just doesn't seem to make sense. You know you're in the will of God. You know you're listening to him. You know as best as you can tell that you're taking one step in front of another following God. And yet, the circumstances around you say one thing. This doesn't make sense, Tom. This seems to be crazy. And the amazing thing is this. Is, and this is the key thing, guys, not to miss. Is that we can in those moments so easily think... Well, because this doesn't make sense, I must be out of the will of God. I must be doing something completely wrong. Or, worse still, God isn't who I thought he was. God's had a personality transplant. God's not who I thought he was. Now, this is the big thing today, is that when we're in those situations, and we know as best as we can, according to Scripture and the consciences of our hearts, that we are in line with God's will, and yet it doesn't make sense, this is the thing, this is the big idea, is that God wants us to be a people who handle it well. Who don't panic, who don't make wrong assumptions, but handle it well. And the great news is this. The main hero that we have been looking at as a church for the last few weeks, whose name is? Abraham. Abraham, today we're going to come to the pinnacle, the Everest of all of his tests. Okay? Abraham has been having test after test after test. Challenge, difficult things like the Christian life. Christian life isn't easy, but you know God. And this is Abraham's story. Okay? He's been walking with God and things have been happening that haven't been easy, but he's been doing well. And they've been making sense. But today, we come to his biggest, most juicy, difficult test of all. The Everest of tests. Because this time, not only is what God asking him to do is tricky and difficult, it doesn't make sense. So friends, I hope you're ready because we're going to see one of the most amazing, real stories. Okay, this is real history. Real stories that happened to a real man in the Middle East a few thousand years ago. And you, we are going to see a man pass with flying colours so that you and I when we enter those moments in our life, which are guaranteed, say guaranteed, guaranteed, guaranteed as a Christian, where you think, this does not make sense. You can go, oh, Abraham, let's look at his life and you will learn. Okay, so let's read together. And what I want us to do is this. Normally I read the whole passage in one go. Today, I'm going to be a little bit naughty. We're going to read it in three little stages because I want us to savour every stage. 
I want us to actually, as best we can, enter into the world of the Bible. I want us to actually smell, not literally, but in our hearts, as it were, and in our ears, be right in the moment that Abraham was, was at, so that we can actually experience what he said. And then we're going to see three very important lessons today. I always have three points, nearly always. Number one, we're going to see the first lesson here to doing well when it doesn't make sense is this. Know it's God. We've got to know it's God. Number two, we have to know his power. And then number three, we're going to see here, we need to know his love. It isn't rocket science, but it's profound. It isn't complex, but it's life-changing. So let's look first of all at the first few verses. So read from verse 33 of the previous chapter, just to give us the context. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned there many days in the land of the Philistines. And after these things, God tested Abraham. Remember that. God tests us. God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here am I. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. And go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. And so Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. First key when it doesn't make sense is this. No, it's God. Just say, no, it's God. No, it's God. Okay, I want us to picture the scene. Picture the scene here, okay? It's, I love this verse here. It says, start with... Oh, dear. I think we need to invest in a new table. Verse 33. Abraham planted... Thanks, Tim. A tamarisk tree... In Bathsheba. Now, I don't know what a tamarisk tree is. Liz Dallison might know. Some of you gardeners may well know. I think it's probably a bit like a kind of a palm tree or something. But the scene here, thanks to him, is that Abraham, he's had a tricky few chapters, okay? But things now are really good. He's planting a tree. You can just picture the scene with me, okay? You know, he's thinking, it's been a pretty tough few months, few years, but things are good. My son's come. My wife's looking great. You know, I'm going to plant a tree. So he plants a tree and he hangs out, gets his little, you know, deck chairs out, puts on a bit of Bob Marley. No worries. Boo -boo 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 yeah. Puts on his shades. Maybe he's got, I don't know, maybe some... <laughs> I was going to say some Bermuda shorts, okay? He's got his little vest on. He's just relaxing. Maybe some cloudy lemonade. You know the scene. He's just relaxing. There he is. Things are good. And then into that situation, we see these words. God said to him, Abraham, and not surprising, Abraham, full of optimism, says, here I am. Turn the music down a little bit, God speaking. Hey, here, here I am. And God's like, hi, hi, uh, Abraham, good to have your attention for a moment. Just want to say a few things. Can you take your son, uh-huh, your only son, yeah, yeah, I know the one, whom you love. Oh, no, what's going on here? Can you take him and offer him? as a burnt offering. I, I don't know, I'm just speculating, but my feeling is, is at this moment, Abraham may well have had one of those moments. You know what it's like, you're in a noisy place, perhaps a train station or something. You're on your mobile to your loved one, and you're like, sorry, love, sorry, I th so noisy. I thought you said, I, th I thought you said I was dumped. I'm sure that's not what you said, but... It's a, oh, you, you did say that. Oh, right, oh, okay. You know, it's kind of one of those moments where... You know, he's got his Bob Marley on, he's relaxing, he's got his tamarisk tree, he's just chilling out. And God says, take your son, whom you love, your only son, no, 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 and offer him there as a burnt offering. It's, it's, it's insane. It's like, what? And remember this, guys, walk with me here. This is the son he's waited 25 years for? 25 years since God first promised this? This is the son that God is reminding him in three different ways. Your son, your only son, the one you love. God is using language here to ram home the point. This is the most precious thing in the world to him. This is Isaac. This is his boy. This is his son 
that he would have, he would have taught to walk. He, he would have you know, changed his nappies. He, he, would have, he would have tucked him into bed at night. He would have spout his hair. He would have prayed for him at night. Prayed that he'd have good dreams. This is his son that he would have whispered about. As parents do when they're asleep. Wasn't it funny today when Abraham, sorry, when Isaac, you know, fell over, but it was so cute. This is his son that he would have, you know, he would have taken down to the Stone Age Park and played <laughs> football with a boulder with, you know. Pushed him on his little Stone Age swing and on his little square wheel trike, you know. This was his son. And in this context, God says, take him and kill him. This really happened. This, just, I want us just to savour the emotional challenge that Abraham would have faced at this moment. I, I can't honestly comprehend it. And there would have been as well, not just an emotional challenge, but a huge theological conundrum. Because as we know, if we've been part of the story for the last few weeks, you'll know that God had promised that through this miracle son, the whole world would be blessed. And now God's saying, I want you to kill him. And yet, in that context, we see this phenomenal response from Abraham. We see this phenomenal response here in verse 3. So Abraham arose. We do not read Abraham, we do not read that Abraham then says, wait a minute God, what the heck are you talking about? Can I just have a little moment here? Have you gone mental? What are you talking about? This is my son. Which I think probably would sort of summarise most of our responses. Am I not wrong? But he doesn't. He just arises. He just arises and goes to the place where God has said to him, I can't really think of a situation as a believer like this, if I'm honest with you. It's just mind-blowing. So Abraham arose. And so for the first time today, we're going to ask ourselves the question that we're going to do all this morning is, how? How did Abraham, when in a situation that did not make sense, how, oh Lord, did he do so mind-blowingly well? How did, where did he get the strength from to do that? How did he do this? And are you ready for this? I've already given you the answer. The first key was this. He knew it was God. He knew it was God. Now you might think, Tom, you've got to give me more than that, mate. That's just a little bit, a bit basic. But we mustn't miss this first hugely important thing here. Is that Abraham arose with phenomenal obedience, firstly because he knew the one who was asking him to do this seemingly impossible mad thing was none other than God. And so his response is immediate and complete obedience. Now I think we have to learn something from this. Because if you're anything like me, I'm pretty okay at obedience as long as in the equation it includes a little thing called understanding. Yeah? As long as it's like, well, God's telling me this and it does make sense. Let's be honest, it kind of makes sense, you know. But when it's just obedience and there's, there's nothing on the other end of the equation, just, just obedience? What? Just obedience? Whoa. We're in a very cynical nation. We are such a cynical nation. We do never like our governments. You know, kids don't like their teachers. They don't trust parents. And it's okay to be like that. If you're a Christian here today, we can so easily just have a little bit of that in us. And so then when it comes to God, the highest authority telling us to do something, we can go, hmm, obedience as long as I understand. So for example, God says very clearly, Jesus says it so often, with prayer, I want you to persist in prayer, okay? It's not just about praying occasionally, it's about persisting in prayer. And we go, but God, if I've said it once, why do I need to say it again? I don't understand, so I won't do it. Whereas actually God says, no, you may not understand, but when my word tells you to do it, you say, how high, okay? There's a thing called humility. God's word is so clear. God says, get baptized. But we go, but Lord, I don't fully understand it. I'm going to take about 30 years trying to understand the theology. Then I'll do it. No, no. My word is clear. Get baptized. 
Repent and be baptized. So you do it. The list goes on. Why should I, Lord, stay in this painful situation that I'm in? I don't understand. God's placed you there. If you know you're walking with God as best as you can tell, with your conscience, with the word of God humbly, and yet you're entering into a painful situation, God may well be saying, I just want you to endure well. And this is so key for us, because we can be such a people who, unless we understand, we won't obey. I love Peter. If you don't know much about Peter in the Bible, he's like a big, burly fisherman man. And there's a bit where, thank you, rah, thank you, Hugh. He's in, there's a bit where he's in a boat with some other guys, and uh, you know, as happens, Jesus walks on the water. And he just says one word to Peter. What is that word? Come. Come. And I love Peter, because he's just like, I'm there! You know, he's just out there, straight into the water. We would be like, well, just a minute. So how, when you say walk on the water, do you mean like you're going to turn it into like ice? Or are you going to like give me some little sort of you know, inflatable shoes? I'm waiting for them. <laughs> How's this going to work? Some sort of winch from heaven? You know, I, I, no, I'm just going to understand this, Lord. I'm going to use my mind. And actually, he just says, come, obey Peter. Because the Christian life is not about logic. It's about walking with the supernatural God. It's about relationship. And so he calls us at times into situations like walking on water. Probably not literally. He's talking about that you know, metaphorically. That we have to step out of the boat into a situation where we may not understand, but God calls us to. And I think this is huge because we can despise obedience for the sake of it. And yet it's key. It's massive. Many of you will know a guy called Terry Virgo who leads... New Frontiers, which is the movement of churches we're part of, part of a movement of churches, about 800 churches across the world, led by a guy called Terry. And six years ago, something happened. There was a, a, an annual gathering of the movement, or a lot of the movement, uh, in a place called Stoneleigh in England. Now, this was the single biggest gathering of Christians in the entire of Europe. The music that came out of the event would almost, without failing, top the Christian charts it was huge, massively influential. It was like the, you know, the, the golden goose, if that's the right phrase. It was the, 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 the jewel in the crown is the phrase I'm looking for, I think. It was this beautiful thing. Everyone loved it. Get a stony, yes, you get a stony. It was great. Families together, kids playing, sunshine, you know, a bit of Bob Marley, no worries. It was just great. <laughs> Brilliant. And then Terry, one, one, one stonely, just announces, we're closing stonely. Excuse me? What? 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 <laughs> Terry, have you gone mad? We're closing stone. Okay? We're going. We're going. And we're like, yay, we're going. What's he talking about? Man's lost it. But we, he's Terry, he's the leader. Okay, we'll do it. And when he was interviewed about this, after this, the press was like, why on earth, Terry, are you closing this? Do you know his answer? It's very complicated. God told me to. God said. There's a thousand reasons why we shouldn't do it. Not a logic level. But God said. It doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense. But God said. Now we, with hindsight, look six years on from then and look at the movement and we go, well, it was a no-brainer. Of course, we would do the same. We can see that as a result of this, now mission has accelerated massively. Huge new numbers of leaders have, have risen up. We've started church planting at a far greater rate all across the world because of that. But at the time, it seemed potty. It seemed bad. But this is it. Terry knew that sometimes when you know it's God, you just got to do it. But secondly, we see here, the second key here, it wasn't just that Abraham knew it was God. He also knew God's power. Let's read on with the story. Verse 4. And on the third day, so Abraham now, he's been walking for three days with his boy and some other servants going to the place where he's going to execute him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. And then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship, if you catch my drift, and come again to you. Say, come again to you. Those words are huge. Okay? He's saying to the servants, me and Isaac, this is where we're going off on our own, okay? We're going to worship. I, that's code for, we're going to do this thing. We're going to offer the burnt offering. And he says these words to them. I 
will come again to you. And all the scholars, all the commentators on this agree that it's not that Abraham there is just like offering a cover story. Yeah, he knows that, you know, really, Isaac, this is the end of the, the road for him. We're not coming back again. No, no, here, Abraham truly believed that he would somehow be able to come back with Isaac to that place. So this is the million-dollar question. How on earth did he think that? How on earth did he believe that? And the answer we find is in the book of Hebrews. So if you've got your Bible with you, turn to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. We find here, in Hebrews chapter 11, the writer of the to the Hebrews here, by the Spirit, has a revelation of how Abraham was enabled to say with all integrity, yes, I'm going to do something that looks like it's the end of the road for my son, but we're going to come back in a few minutes. We're going to come back to this place. From verse 17 of chapter 11. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac, your offspring shall be named. This is the thing. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. He considered God. He considered God. How did Abraham, how did he say those words with integrity? This is the thing. He had a revelation of the power of God. God's character is phenomenal. There are so many attributes to God's character. His love, his mercy, his kindness. But I want us today to zoom in with a laser-like focus here, as Abraham did, on one aspect of his character, and it's this. The power of God. He had a revelation that God was able. He was able to even raise him from the dead. So I don't want us to miss this here. It wasn't like Abraham was just like really laid back and blasé about this. Think about it. If he was able, if he was living with the, with the revelation that God was able, even, even able to raise him from the dead, then of course that means he was, he'd come to grips with the fact that he was going to have to kill him. But his faith in God, a God of power, was so huge, was so active, was so real at this moment that he was able to say, we're going to come back. Because I know that God's promised that through my son, the nations are going to be blessed. So even though what God is telling me to do seems crazy, our God is so great and so powerful, he can even raise him from the dead. He considered God was able. He considered God was able. This was because when you look at the life of Abraham, he had had the privilege as we have had. He had walked with God and seen God do miracle after miracle after miracle. In Genesis 12, we'd seen when Abraham's wife Sarai was in trouble with the Egyptian leader, God sends a plague, a disease on him in order that she would be released. Phenomenal. In chapter 18, we've seen God promise that within one year from when that thing happened, this miracle son would be born. True to his word, that miracle happened. We've seen in Genesis 19, two angels come from heaven in order to sort out Lot. Now Lot was Abraham's nightmare nephew. And he came and sorted out his family. He got him out of the place which God was judging him. So on those three occasions alone, Abraham had seen a God of power in real action. And he had allowed those experiences to become part of him. He had allowed those experiences of God doing miracles change how he lived his life. What will we do with those bits of information I said at the beginning about three healings? Those are real miracles that God has done in our day and age. And he doesn't do them simply to change bodies, although he does. He also does it to change this body, to change the corporate body. His people, that we get changed. We have a responsibility when miracles happen to go, wow, my God is a bit bigger than I realised. We have to be a people who, like Abraham, the first key was know it's God. Just be obedient, trust him. But secondly, know his power. Know it in your hearts. 
Know it in your lives, no matter what you're facing. I can say with all integrity and all humility and confidence, God is able. He absolutely is able. He's so able. I love Ephesians 1. Paul writing to this huge, beautiful, amazing church. And yet he says to them, my prayer for you is this, is that you would have a revelation, I love this phrase, of the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is available. And I love this phrase. He wants us then to have a revelation of the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe. I always think when I read, read that, maybe it's just me, you know like, uh, like riot police, when they're trying to control people without actually hurting them, they use those huge like power hoses, which sort of, you know, blast people, you know, they're so powerful. Whenever I see this phrase, this immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, I just have this image of God going, do you understand the power that is available to you? That's a positive thing. You know, God's not a right police man. I'm saying, God is the power that is available for us who believe. I love this. I just, this changes everything. When we have a revelation of the power of God, God doesn't call us into situations that we don't understand just so that we can be obedient, but he secondly does it so that we can know his power. That we can know the immeasurable, pain, of the immeasurable greatness of his power. If I was to say to you, the City Church football team playing uh, Faversham FC, half time, it's not good, okay? It's not good. Five nil down. They go off into the, uh, into the changing room. Craig, are you the manager? You are. Craig's the manager. Craig is a little team talk. Gather around, guys. You know, the, the reality is this, is that Andy Shev is playing badly. John Nottage, I just don't know what's going on with him. And Dodge, uh, no, he's not good. So we're going to have some replacements. Sorry, guys. I've got three players. You might have heard of them. One called David Beckham, one called Ronaldo, and one called Wayne Rooney. I've just got some connections, and they're going to come on, and they're going to play in your place. Is that okay? That's all right? Of course, no problem. Now, at that point... The mood's going to change, okay? The mood is going to change in the changing room from one of despondency with 5 nil down to one of smugness, excitedness. We're going to absolutely demolish them. Even if those are the only three players who went on, Faversham FC are going down, baby. They are going to lose. Now, this is the thing. What's changed is that the team have considered the greatness of those three players. And suddenly their confidence in the obstacle of the, of the 5-0 you know, scoreline thus far is like, could be 50-0. It doesn't matter. We've got those three guys. Nothing's changed in them. They are still aware of their weakness, the rest of the team. No offence. They know that they are just limited. But they've got the power of these three guys on their team. It's not they're trying to pretend. Let's try really hard. No, no. They're just considering, considering the power and the quality of those players. And so they would go on and absolutely demolish Faversham FC. Now, you have to understand that this is what, the, this is what as Christians, we, this is the, the battle of faith that we all face. It's the easiest thing in the world to get our eyes on the things around us. But what this tells us is, and, and let me lead this as a challenge with us, do you consider God? Do you make it your prayer? Do you make it your lifestyle? To daily lift your eyes off your own limitations and your own weaknesses and to flood yourself, to cry out to God for revelation of the bigness of his power, of the immensity of who you have playing on your side. And so right now as I'm saying this, I guarantee there are challenges in each of your hearts, in each of your lives, real, real challenges that I don't want to belittle. But God, with a loving firmness as a father, is saying, I want to say humbly, and yet as God, you have to consider me. I want you today, O oh City Church, to consider the power of God that is available to you. That's his word. That's his promise. A blood-brought promise. The greatness of his power that is available to you. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking, Lord, I was just thinking and praying about you guys, the church. And I felt God smile, actually. I felt God say, do you know what? In huge part, you as a church are a people who do this. I know many of you here have moved to this church physically because God said move. You know, stage one, 
God said, I knew it was God, so I'm going. And you're here, and actually there'll be some challenges you're facing. You've moved away from home, and you're, there's perhaps new friends that you're trying to make, and it's, but it's, there's challenges. And today God would say to you, he wants you to have that second arrow in your quiver. Not just know it was God, but know his power. Know his immeasurable power to enable you to do well. Enable you to have friends. Enable you to actually slot into place in this church in a way that is actually supernatural. Some of you here are young leaders and you have stepped up because of point one. I knew it was God. You've stepped up into cell leadership and then you're doing it. And it's terrifying because there's people there who are more gifted than you, who are perhaps are older than you, who are super professionals. And you're like, okay, everyone, give your attention, please. You're at the beginning of the cell group. And you're thinking, my goodness, I am so not up for this. Oh, this is, your point one got me here, obedience. But now I'm like, oh, I'm going to get out of this. I'm the wrong person. Don't do it. God would say to you, no, point two, know his power. Know the power of God available to you to do the impossible. Some of you here who are single have actually said no to offers of going out with people who, are, who are, perhaps don't share the same value system as you. That's been really hard. And you've done it because of point one, out of obedience. But you're at that point thinking, I don't know if I can keep doing this. This is really hard. I'm really lonely. I would want to say to you, no, point two as well. Know that his power is available to you today to either give you someone to be with or his power is available daily to endure well. To endure well. Either way, his power is with you. Some of you now are in places where people have hurt you. Perhaps work colleagues. And, 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 and you're in this place, you go, I know I'm meant to be in this job. God's got me here, but right now I am struggling with that person. God wants to say to you today, know his power. Either his power to change that person or to change your heart every day supernaturally so you can endure well. Some of you have given, for example, in our building offerings twice a year, obedience. And now the 10th of May is looming large. And you're thinking, oh, I don't know if I can do this again. I'm a bit short this month, Tom. God's power available. God loves to get right up into every area of our life. The same power that raised Christ from the dead. I want to say, when you understand these two together, that know it's God and know his power, everything changes. Now, I didn't know whether to share this with you, but I asked Tim, and he said, it'll be okay. So, here we go. 18 months ago, something happened. I'd been in the church for about eight months, I think, lead over for about eight months, and um, the building fund that we've been doing twice a year, giving money for the day when God opens up a bit of land or a building or something, was standing at an amazing 140,000 pounds. And I knew all of us had given <laughs> so much to it. And then I was in the conversation with a friend of mine, based in another church uh, in a very poor nation. And he, God had given them this incredible opportunity and they had done amazing uh, fundraising and they'd given outrageously. And they were just a tiny bit short and they had a deadline coming up, just, just a tiny bit short, just, just 140,000 pounds short, just 140, oh no, 140,000? That exact, yeah, 100. And this person just dropped it in without any awareness of what we were doing. Any sort of manipulation, I was like, oh, <gasps> oh no. And for the next few weeks, I was in this place of thinking, I tried to put it away, you know, like, oh, just coincidence, it's okay, put it away. No, no. God just kept on hemming me in. It's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence, Tom. Are you going to trust me? I, I, I talked to the elders, I talked to the finance guy, I talked to the trustee, he was like, guys, look, and I was like, look, this, this is probably, a, do you think God is saying? You think we've got saying this? We can't even, we probably can't even legally do this. Because you know, the guys at church, CJ have given this for the land here, for the building here. They will kill me. <laughs> they will lovingly kill me. 
I, we can't, this is probably illegal. Oh my goodness. And I just, I, I, it was a rough few weeks, shall we say. That Christmas wasn't so good. I was just like hemmed in with this thing. And then I had the misfortune, fortune slash, whichever way you want to look at it, of talking to an incredibly godly leader, an older guy who was an amazing track record with this kind of stuff and just, I won't say his name, but a very, very, a very uh, holy guy who really walks with God. And I just said, explain the situation. I was like, surely God doesn't, you know, probably, do you think he just wants us to maybe loan it, a bit of it, or just sort of ignore it? You know? And he said, I, I was like, surely you don't think we should actually give it to them. And just a huge smile on his face, he said, do it. Do it. Totally smacks of God. You can't outgive God. If this is God, even though it doesn't make sense, do it. I was like, ah, not the answer I was looking for. And I felt God say, that's it. You got your answer. Tell me, boy. I was like, I'm going to get sacked for this. I won't be a leader very much longer if this happens. And anyway, so in my heart, I felt that this really was, this was what God was saying. As an eldership, we were in a difficult place, but feeling like God was clearly speaking. Anyway, to cut a long story short, just before we were thinking we're going to have to somehow talk to you guys about this, I had to have a conversation with this guy, and he said, you'll never believe it. At the 11th hour, £140,000 came in. It's all fine. We're going for it. It's brilliant. <sighs> hey, great. <gasps> I felt God say, listen, that genuinely was a test. It was an Abraham-Isaac test. Because God, God said, listen, do you really think if you give up that money that you're going to, oh no, we don't have enough money now when God opens it up. I could add 10 millionaires in one Sunday who will sort it all out for you if that was my will. God is sovereign. I was like, oh yeah, that's kind of true actually. The issue here is not the logic and the maths, it's whether God is saying it. Now praise God, he didn't ask us to do it. But I wanted to share that with you because, do you know what, there's going to be times, it may not be anything like specific like that, but God is causing us as a church to flex our faith muscles. Would be we we'd be willing? Would we be willing, if God clearly was saying it, in view of his power to supply all our needs, would we be willing? And I know you would say, amen, amen, amen. God has promised us, I believe, a building. And the way he wants to bring it is his sovereign will. And so actually the key thing is that we stay in line with his will. We don't try and apply logic all the time. So, number one, key, know it's God. Number two, know his power. And thirdly, though, we see here, know his love. Final bit of reading, verse 6. Verse 6 of Genesis 22. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and he laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. And when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there, laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the top, on altar, on top of the wood. And then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. Hallelujah. So Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide. I bet he did. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Our God is a provider. Jehovah Jireh. It even rhymes. How good is that? Our God is amazing. What an amazing... This, this is better than Hollywood. 
This is outstanding. This really happened. He's there. He's obedient. This son is carrying the wood. The son that he's grown up with, that he's taught to walk, that he's loved, that he's prayed for, that he's invested in. And he's right at the moment with the dagger in the air. And an angel says, you've passed. Well done. And in an instant, he provides a ram. No problem. And the ram is offered in place of Isaac. And as we come to an end this morning, I want to say this. It is so important if we're going to, in those situations which don't make sense, that A, we know it's God. Two, we know his power. But thirdly, and just as importantly, we know his love. And this final bit of the story booms out the love of God. You see, how does it prove the love of God? I'll tell you how. Is that this passage is actually pointing to one even more incredible passage in the Bible. It's called Calvary, the place where Jesus Christ died. Is that this whole story, as amazing as it is, is actually, it's, it's a dress rehearsal for the real performance that really happened. You see, what we have to understand here is that between these two stories of Abraham and Isaac and then Jesus at Calvary that are deliberately parallel after parallel after parallel. You see, Isaac and Jesus are deliberately paralleled so that we would see them and marvel. We see, for example, is that they were both born sons of a promise. That both Isaac and Jesus were both born as a result of a miracle. That they were both firstborn sons. That they were both greatly loved by their fathers. We see that both of them carried their wood to the place of execution. We see with Jesus, as with Isaac, that both of them willingly laid down their lives. Both of them were laid down as an offering. And both of them came back from the dead. With Isaac, it was figurative, but with Jesus, it literally happened. And the amazing other detail here is this. This place, Moriah, where this is all happening, the geographical place where Abraham and Isaac are, guess what? It's the same region where hundreds of years later, Jesus Christ hung on a cross. It's the physical same region as Calvary. This is phenomenal, the detail of God here. But what we have to understand this, is that this story here, as emotive and as dramatic as it is, is pointing to a phenomenal great story. The most important story that you will ever hear. If you're a non-Christian here today, I want to say this. The gospel, as much as it is about Jesus' life, as a perfect representation of God on earth, it was all leading to a climax. It was all leading to that day when Jesus Christ gave his life willingly at the cross. You see, if you're anything like me, when we've been looking at this story this morning, we've been kind of putting ourselves in the place of Abraham, haven't we? We've been saying, wow, Abraham really did well. We should be like that. We need to do well when God is testing us. And that's good. That's right. But actually, as we come to a close this morning, we need to understand, ultimately, the story is not calling us to be like Abraham, actually to show us that Abraham is a picture of the heavenly father leading his son, Jesus, Isaac, to the place at Calvary. It's a picture not so much of us trying to do well in our own strength. No, no. Actually, it's about pointing to the most important event that ever happened in this entire universe, and I'm not overstating that, is when God the Father, the true and better Abraham, led his son Jesus, the true and better Isaac, to the place of crucifixion. But this is where there is an even more amazing twist in the tale, is that there was no 11th hour escape for Jesus. There was no suddenly ram that came out of the bush for Jesus. The Bible tells us that Jesus was the lamb that was slain. He was the Isaac and the ram. He was the one who actually was killed physically in reality. And so we have to, as we come to an end, you, we have to ask ourselves, well, why? Why, God, 
Would you allow Jesus to be killed? And this is why the Bible tells us Every single one of us, every human that has ever existed, is existing and will exist. All of us. Tom Shaw at the front of the list has fallen short. That we have offended God. That we have sinned. That we have turned our back on living in a life with God. However you want to put it. And the Bible is clear. Is that there is a consequence the wages of sin, the wages of a life without God, the bringer of life is death. That's actually where the Bible tells us this world is heading without Jesus. Because we brought it on ourselves. And so, actually in that picture of Abraham and Isaac at one level, we're kind of more like Isaac in a place of impending judgment. Right judgment. God who is perfect and loving and kind cannot ignore the things in our life. But, And this is the greatest news in the world. As John 3.16 famously says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. It wasn't like he picked him out of a, a big family. His only son. He gave his only son so that he could face the righteous judgment for Tom Shaw's sin. Every sin I've ever committed and will commit was placed on Christ. All my sin was placed on him. And so he became sin and God judged him for it so that I could be given totally free forgiveness. Christ was made sin so I could be made righteous. By grace! I did not earn a single thing. If you're a Christian here today, you will say, Amen. It's the grace of God. Being a Christian starts with realizing you are the weakest person. It is not about trying to be good. It is not about trying harder. It is about saying, you know what? I need to be rescued. I need to be rescued. And I want to say here as we come to an end today, if you don't know Jesus... Right today, in a simple act of of choosing to go his way, you don't have to do anything special. You don't have to say any special words. You can say, God, I know I need to, in faith, access that forgiveness. Let's close our eyes, shall we, just for a moment. If you're here today and you know you're not a Christian, you know perhaps you're almost... You kind of been looking at this thing for a while. I want to say as simply as I can, God absolutely is wild about you. He loves you with such an intensity, he gave his only son. Jesus was punished so you can be included and adopted instantly into his family. I don't know if there's anything greater. I I don't think there is. And right today, I want to encourage you to say yes. To say yes, I I want to access this forgiveness. I don't want to face God based on my own works. And I want to say right now, I encourage you, as a response, just pop your hand in the air. Everyone's eyes are closed. God and myself are here. Just want to say right today, if you know, you just say, yeah, I want to go God's way. Right now, I want to encourage you just to make a response so that afterwards we can connect and talk it through. Push through any fear right now. Say, God, I need you. Place your hand high in the air. Say, Father, I need you. And I want to finish by saying this. You can open your eyes. If you are a Christian here today and you're in a situation that you don't understand, Romans 8, 32 says this. He who did not spare his only son, but graciously gave him up, how will he not therefore graciously give us all things? Friends, we're going to worship in just a moment. And I want to say this. This is one of those awesome stories that leads us into a place of awestruck worship. 
Because this is the fact, is that the Christian life starts with getting forgiven. <laughs> it starts with saying, thank you, Jesus. But the scripture tells us that then, throughout the rest of our life, the great encourager to our lives is this, is that if we know that God gave his son Jesus, he will grant you the desires of your heart if it be his will. He will give you all that you need. It doesn't mean your life will be easy, but it does mean that God's grace will be with you. And so as we worship, I want to say this, even as we do enter into his presence, give him those things in your life that today you know, actually, that's difficult, that's challenging. Give them to him and say, God, but I recognize that when you've led us to that place, that your power is available and that your love is unstoppable, like a dam that's bursting. What else? What else is there to know? Should we stand? Cast the band back. We're going to worship our God, a God who loves you. I want to say this as well, is I know that there's people in this room specifically who are facing situations that really don't make sense in a big way. And yet, as far as you can tell, you know that you've been walking with God. I want to encourage you, even right now, our red t-shirted ministry team are going to be on my right, your left. Come forward and talk to them. Let them pray for you. Prayer is the most powerful, wonderful gift from God. Come forward and be ministered to by God through these guys. They would love to pray with you. God has brought you to a point now of realising that actually he is able and willing to change those situations, to, to enable you to do well in those situations. Lord, we love you. As we worship you now, we say thank you with all of our hearts that you chose to give your son for us. You gave him willingly. God, we praise you. Lord, when we say God is a loving God, we're not just talking in a fuzzy way. We're saying, Lord, historically, you proved it beyond any doubt. Sometimes we feel it, sometimes we don't. But today, the anchor of our faith is Jesus Christ, given, given, poured out for us, and then raised triumphantly, gloriously, raised from the dead to prove that even death no longer is a challenge. Even death has lost its sting. Even death now no more shall produce fear in our hearts. God, we worship you and we say, Lord, receive our worship. We are humbled and exalted. Lord, we are broken and built up all at the same time as we consider what you've done for us. Oh, mighty King, we worship you.